Hello, it's Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada and the Lug Nuts facility. And uh, what we have here is a uh, 2006 Spiker C8 Roadster um, that uh, we're giving a major service. So um, the rear clamshell uh, doesn't uh, uh, fold up that easily. You need to, you need to, there's a bit of disassembly involved, taking the, um, dry sump uh, oil tank off and some other issues to get it up. But this is what you need to do to give it uh, a major service. And in this state, uh, I thought it would be interesting to go through the Spiker C8 and sort of point out all the shiny, shiny bits and uh, go over the construction um, and then provide a little bit of background into this uh, really, really cool car. So. Um, I got my spiker hat out. I, I used to sell these for a couple of years uh, in uh, 2009 and 2010. Um, and I've known this car uh, since it was new. Um, we're doing a light recommissioning on it. It hasn't, it hasn't really moved in 15 years. So we're you know, changing all the, all the fluids and giving it a really thorough detail. Also, we've um, uh, dry ice blasted the undercarriage and the suspension. Uh, to get it all cleaned up. We still have a lot of polishing and uh, detail work to do on it, as well as the service. But uh, we'll, we'll start here with the anatomy of a spiker. Okay, well, where do we start? Well, let's, uh, let's have a look at the, at the tub. And this would be a uh, aluminum monocoque. Um, and uh, we can see that it is welded and I believe it's also bonded in some sections. And to the aluminum monocoque, we add these, uh, these large diameter tubes, and that would be the front support for the clamshell and the radiator support, and that would also form the, the uh, impact absorption. So these, these pieces would then be you know, sacrificial and spare the monocoque. If an impact went into here, well, I think then you have to start with a new car. Um, uh, okay, you, you wouldn't be able to fix that. But that this would be similar to, well, this would be similar to what a Ferrari would be, similar to the later Aston Martins. I, th I think the Astons use more bonding and less welding. Um, and it's also riveted too. So the Astons are mostly bonded and riveted. This one's mostly welded. The Ferraris as well, I think, are mostly welded. Okay. So then we have the, um, uh, the tub, the safety cell of the car, and then we can see the aluminum framework continues. And again, welded construction all the way to the rear, and then it supports the rear clamshell there. Okay. So in the middle, we've got an Audi, basically an Audi R8 um, powertrain, uh, 4.2 liter V8, four valve per cylinder, five speed manual gearbox. Okay, so that's straight out of an R8 and uh, it's 400 horsepower. Um, walking around, uh, we'll see this is the, the, the tank for the, uh, the dry sump oil system. So it's a dry sump engine, which means that the engine is fairly low down in the chassis and you don't see, you don't see an oil pan, uh, a deep oil pan on this engine because it is dry sumped. Uh, we have the fuel system. We have two tanks which are outboard in the sills. Um, that's a fuel accumulator, I believe. And the, these braided lines are all the fuel hoses. There's two tanks and we can see what they look like. There's one in there and it just slides in probably most of the way of the side cell. Okay, so that would be um, putting the weight uh, as low down uh, and as central as possible, which is the, you know, the objective of a mid-engine car for a low center of gravity and low polar moment of inertia, as they say. Okay, so we have a fairly low car. Um, uh, we've got the uh, double A-arm 
uh, suspension. We can see the mounting for that on the chassis. There's the upper and the lower. And then we have something that's kind of unusual in a road car. We have inboard suspension. So normally that uh, spring shock unit would be vertical and, you know, anchored, you know, anchored, you know, up here somewhere. But to get the, to get the um, profile down, the suspension can go inboard. There's very few production cars with inboard suspension because it kind of, obviously it takes the, out the trunk space with the front and the rear. And you can see the inboard front suspension there. So with that in the way, you don't get a trunk. So most sports cars would uh, have a vertical shock unit and they wouldn't be inboard. So only the Carrera, Porsche Carrera GT has inboard suspension. Just about every race car has inboard front, inboard front and rear suspension. I don't know of another production car that has inboard inboard suspension. I'm sure there is one, but I, 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 don't, I can't remember one. Okay, so uh, then uh, we look at the mountings and uh, we've got, uh, you know, solid mountings here. Well, I guess there's a little bit of a bush there, but it's a very direct, uh, a very direct system. Um, uh, these are spherical bearings, uh, also, also known as uh, rose joints. So there's no play in these units at all. So you, you can get kind of the ultimate precision um, and it's not, uh, the uh, movements of the steering and the suspension are not absorbed by rubber bushes. I mean, there's a little bit of a buffer in there, but I think that's just a, that's just a, uh, um, a dust seal. Okay, we have center lock rims and we can see we have the pins here that uh, locate the wheels but then there's a big nut that goes on there. So I'll show you, uh, that's what the back of the wheel is. And we're just about to clean that up. And so it can be, it can be put on in, 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 uh, in, uh, in any of those holes. And then that's the big nut that, uh, that fastens. That's 406, I think, uh, pound feet of torque to get those on. So that's an awfully big torque wrench you need. And this thing here, um, this is kind of clever. If we undo this, you kind of think it looks like a bit like a reservoir of some sort. Um, let's just undo it here. And then what you can find out is uh, that's, the, uh, <laughs> that's the nut for the wheel. So <laughs> we, were looking for, we were looking for that for a while and uh, we're like trying to source one until we got tipped off that uh, all the cars actually have that. Okay, so, okay, in the front, um, more uh, uh, rose-jointed. Um, well, let's see, are they rose-jointed or not? Well, no, these would be, on the front, it looks like they're standard ball joints. Um, we've got the, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of a rubber buffer there. Um, we've got the anti-roll bar here in the front and then upper and lower a arms is in the rear and then the inboard rear suspension and then that's the steering rack that uh, sits over there there's no brake booster on the car um, we've got the brake fluid reservoir there and then the master cylinder would be in this box battery lives down in there not the easiest thing to change and then this leather strap, there is a toolbox uh, right there. And that toolbox lives uh, in the front. There's a panel in the center of the, of the, of the bonnet uh, and uh, it unbolts, uh, which we did, we took it apart. Okay, so we've got a windshield wiper from a Mercedes 124E class <laughs> That's, uh, that I recognize. Wiper motor is there. Um, we've got, uh, well, we can see where the steering column meets the steering rack there. Wiper fluid, really lovely um, aluminum radi radiator with twin electric fans is there. And spiker propeller. And then we have 
It looks like a front mounted, that's probably for the AC uh, radiator and uh, smaller radiator in front of a coolant. That's a guess, I might be wrong on that. Uh, okay, so then we've got in the braking department, uh, we've got big six piston AP racing uh, calipers and uh, we have big steel rotors, they're two piece and uh, we have the steel uh, outer portion and then presumably the alloy hub and a little bit of airspace to limit the heat transfer from the steel to the alloy and the hub where the bearings are, okay? So big, um, big brakes, this isn't a heavy car. I think it scales at around 2,700 pounds. Um, that's probably a good, oh, I don't know what an R8 is. R8 is probably 3,600 pounds, something like that. So we're good, you know, probably eight, 900, 1,000 pounds lighter than an, an Audi R8. Uh, with the um, with the same power unit. Uh, okay, so going in the back here, uh, again, it's right out of the R8. We can see the catalytic converters, and we've got a really interesting exhaust. Uh, this Spiker um, has a sport exhaust, and 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 I th I, my understanding is this is a really rare thing to have on a Spiker. And uh, so we can see that uh, we have the cats. It goes straight out these pipes out the back and that goes um, out the bodywork there uh, for the exhaust pipes. Um, the Latin there translates to, for the tenacious, no road is impassable. Okay, so if we have a look at this here, these are, these are valves. Um, uh, that uh, control the flow of the exhaust. And we've got this big mufflers down below. And interestingly, we can see the outlet for those, which goes into the diffuser. Um, so if I understand the system correctly, uh, it has two modes, the, um, the quiet mode and the full performance mode. And in the quiet mode, the exhaust uh, is probably blocked off here and the exhaust gases flow into these big mufflers and then exit below the diffuser. With this valve open, the exhaust goes straight through these cats, uh, you know, about, you know, 18 inches and then blasts out the rear of the car. And then that's a cross pipe that um, equalizes the exhaust pressure between these two pipes. So that's pretty cool. And you'd expect it to be, and it is, um, pretty loud when it's full on. So this is a, uh, this is a very engaging and uh, visceral car uh, to drive. Okay, so uh, now we've got the oil filter uh, conveniently <laughs> tucked away, <laughs> tucked away down there. Individual coils for the spark plugs. Um, and then we've got the, we have the, we have the uh, manufacturer's plates and the EPA and the DOT stickers that are on the, kind of a little bit invisible with the, the, bump, the clamshell down. Um, and there's, of course, the big butterfly for the air intake. And we've got some cross bracing on top of the engine. All right. Uh, we can see the, all the braided lines that connect both fuel tanks and balance out the fuel level. And then the fuel level sender uh, lives inside the tanks, as do the fuel uh, pumps. To get at the fuel pump, you have to disconnect the rear suspension and slide these rectangular fuel tanks out of the car. Uh, okay. Uh, they're five-speed manual cars, and uh, we've got a really outrageous um, interior uh, for the Spikers. That's, that's kind of one of their signature things. And uh, we have an exposed shift gate. So the upper uh, rod is just there for support, and then it's used to pivot the shifting rod, which is on the bottom, and then that goes right back to the gearbox, okay?
Um, for the gauges, we have this uh, engine turned uh, dash. So that's, that's right out of a pre-war Bugatti or Alfa Romeo, uh, where they use sort of wire brushes on the soft aluminum to create uh, uh, a pattern. And uh, then, um, then it, lo it looks like what they've done is they've tried to create sort of uh, almost watch faces, um, you know, for the, for the instruments. So uh, having that, the, the, the decorative bezels and so forth uh, kind of gives the impression of uh, high-end watches. And then added to that, aircraft style toggle switches. And you can see the, um, you can see the toggle there that you flip up and that, uh, flip the red button up and then uh, turn on the uh, electrical power and the start button is immediately below. So that's right out of a aircraft or a helicopter or, or I suppose a race car. And then we see all the switch gear is, um, you know, machined, machined from billet uh, or otherwise uh, turned uh, on a lathe or so on. So you get these, this total bespoke switch gear. Uh, and we see that now, we didn't see that in, in, in 05 and 06 when, this, when these cars came out. Uh, we'd re I don't think we'd ever seen that in a car before. Maybe a Pagani, you have to go look at when they came out with those, but uh, it was a really, you know, it was, it was a really quite interesting uh, at the time. Now we see a lot of resto mods and we see singers and so forth and, 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 and they've done the same thing. Um, we've got scissor doors uh, like, a, like a Lamborghini would have. Uh, wide sills, of course, which we need because they have the fuel tanks and the monocoque in there. We have all this beautiful quilted leather, uh, which probably has its origins in some 60s Italian cars. Like I know a Bizzarini would have, uh, have the quilted leather interior. There's a button and that's the lockout for reverse. Uh, so you need to press that if you hit reverse. And um, uh, the ignition sequence is interesting uh, because it's running an Audi engine and gearbox it's also running an audi ecu it's also running audi like basically a modified audi wiring harness and so that uh, to start the car um, there's actually an audi key that lives in there now i've seen some other videos on spikers that, that incorrectly suggest that that's how you start the car is you turn that key that this key won't start the car it's just to power up the electrical system and the and and they but they wanted to keep that sequence a little bit special and so those two functions are sort of divorced the the black audi key merely energizes the car and gives it electricity and you need to go through the starting position with the red toggle and the uh start button to actually fire it up that that won't start the car alone but the car won't start without without that in there okay so that just kind of lives in the in the glove box uh, we have a parking brake that, uh, that uh, lives over here and um, well, there's room for a couple toothbrushes <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the glove box and there is a shallow uh, luggage tray. Is it still in there? And that lives in here. Um, I do not recommend you put ice cream in there um, because even though it's shielded, it is directly above the exhaust <laughs> and it's probably going to get hot. Um, all the bodywork is, is aluminum, so there's, it's not a carbon fiber car. A lot of the new exotics are carbon fiber. This one's all aluminum. Um, I don't think there's any steel in it except for the suspension. Um, and everything, yeah, everything else that I can see anyway is, uh, is alloy. Um, uh, let's raise the car up on the hoist and we'll have, uh, we'll have a look at it from a different perspective and maybe I will shut the doors so they don't hit that. That would would be that would be a good idea so shut the door 
this here. Um, there's no door handle. You open the door with the remote control or there's a little button on, uh, on the inside of the mirror there, it releases a solenoid uh, to lift the doors up, okay? So let's go up. All right, so we got it up in the air. Um, there's not too many cars, road cars, that open up like this. Uh, I can think of uh, the Lamborghini Mira. Uh, just about every race car where the front and rear clamshells open up like that. Um, having a hard time thinking of any other road car that has this much access. Uh, Dale, can you think of anything? Ford GT. Lamborghini Miro. What else does this? This is Dale. A <laughs> uh, Massel Vallelunga for Sori Special Edition. Well, there you go. <laughs> Just rolls <laughs> off the tongue, doesn't it? Dale knows everything about cars, and he does. He's our uh, head um, foreman, mechanic. Solves any problem. Works on any crazy car. Okay. Uh, knows his cars. All right. So underneath here, we can see the, uh, the aluminum under tray. We still have to polish that. The, uh, the webbed uh, casing for the gearbox, um, handbrake cable there. We've got the Brembo. These are the, 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 the big calipers, of course, for the regular brakes. The, those are for the handbrake. We can see the handbrake uh, cable there. Um, we can see the frame the way the frame is built, cradling uh, the passenger compartment in the engine. And there is the bottom of the dry sump engine. You can see there's no sump there. And then I guess we have some ancillaries at the bottom. That looks like the alternator there. And uh, drive shafts go out. And you can see the bottom of the double A arms. Um, this hose here is the um, balancing hose between the two fuel tanks, which live in the uh, in the uh, in the sills. Um, the under trays we've taken off, and we're going to clean those up. Those are those are behind us, so normally this would be covered. Uh, looks like we've got uh, coolant hoses that are running uh, through the center of the monocoque. Uh, coolant hoses which go to the front uh, that would be a drip for the probably the AC evaporator there and um, you can see the bottom of the car the hubs you can see that the you know the outer uh, brake rotor is just sort of a ring and then bolted to the inner hubs this car still has all its original labels on all the suspension and it's pretty cool that the the suspension arms are all dated like you would in a race car because they'd only be good for so many hours so each suspension component on a race car is dated and this car has all the labels which also date it okay so um we have the al alloy floor pan of the car and what else is underneath here bottom of the radiator we have uh, carbon fiber air scoop um, that uh, shrouds the air comes in into the radiator and then vents out the top of the hood and uh, well that's about it so the construction is very racy you know this would be this would be you know the way you'd build or the way you used to build a race car i guess now race cars are carbon fiber but they'd still have that carbon fiber tub. The, um, 
you know, maybe the race cars would have the, uh, the suspension bolted right to the engine, uh, where, and the engine bolted right to the tub. So I suppose, you know, this engine sits in, in the monocoque and the suspension is anchored on the monocoque. A race car to save some weight would bolt the engine right to the tub and the suspension right to the engine. Um, but that's not a, I don't know of a road car that's ever done that. Uh, could be wrong on that. Uh, but I, I don't, that's just not done for a road car. Uh, there'd be too much vibration into the cabin if that were the case. Okay, so uh, we will continue our work on the spiker and we've got some, some more cleaning up and some more polishing and we've got the major service to do. Uh, and then, uh, and then we're going to, um, we're going to take this car and we're going to, we're going to put it on, bring a trailer and spikers have done really well there lately. Um, this example only has 350 miles on it. It is possibly the, well, I don't, I don't there's about 150 spikers out there. They all have low mileage probably. I don't know how many, if any, have any lower mileage than 350 miles which this car has. So there we go, the anatomy of a spiker, about the closest thing to a race car, or at least an 80s race car, as, as you could get. I've, I've, I've driven them a fair amount, and uh, there, there's tons of fun. Um, they're really direct and uh, quite physical to drive, um, uh, you know, and uh, well, they feel kind of like a race car, which it is. It has some concessions to comfort. It's got a beautiful kind of bejeweled interior, great seats, beautiful leather, you know, so it's just a, a, a really neat combination of race car versus kind of bespoke, I don't know, bespoke luxury good, kind of somewhere in the middle between those two, but a very, a very um, unique, desirable, fun, and also well-made and reliable. It's a good car. Uh, you know, we, we drove them at the track at one of the big NASCAR tracks in the U.S. and these things pounded around the, uh, the autocross course all day long. We went on the banking, uh, uh, you, know, big, the, you know, the big NASCAR bankings, you know, had this car in the heat, you know, 35 degrees all day long, getting, getting driven to the maximum. And none of the cars ever gave us any problem whatsoever. I've done that before with lots of other makes. Uh, with Porsche and so on and like there would always be the Corvette or the Camaro or something that's just too hot and not happy and limp home mode and it's not it's not going to do it anymore it's not made for that the brakes are on fire or whatever it is but uh, not these. these these are properly designed cars um, that uh, have the you know also have the qualities of extreme rarity and and desirability too so but it's a lot of fun to work on these cars thank you very much Lawrence Romanowski from the Lug Nuts facility in Calgary, Canada.